Hey everybody, thanks for watching. This is the Dirt Bike Channel podcast. Today, I've got some really, really important and timely information from Benjamin Burr. Ben Burr, he's the policy director for sharetrails.org or Blue Ribbon Coalition, and I'm gonna bring him on in just a second. But we went 50 minutes into this thing talking, and then I'm like, hey, we should have led with this. And what it is, is there is a place that you can go right now to help our cause, help the moto community. It's sharetrails.org. And even if you don't become a member, it would be very, very helpful if you would at least educate yourself or stay up to date on the current issues. So if you're at sharetrails.org, you can go, one of the menu options is current issues. And if you drop down there, there's two different email uh, subscription lists that you can become a part of and educate yourself. There's the 10,000 plus project to keep Utah open. Uh, and then there's also, there's a camp free, join the dispersed assistance alliance to protect dispersed camping. The environmentalists that are coming at us from all angles, they're not only coming after us in dirt bikes and UTVs and ATVs, side by sides, they're also coming after dispersed camping. And this, these lists are how you can join that fight and actually just become educated on what Blue Ribbon Coalition is doing for all user groups across the nation here in the West, specifically right now. Uh, so go there, become a member of Blue Ribbon Coalition. I'm dead serious. It's 25 bucks, 30 bucks. If you can donate just a few bucks a month, we can make a huge, huge difference on these issues. And now let's go get into the podcast with Ben Burr. Hey, Ben, thank you so much for coming on. It's such a pleasure to have you on Dirt Bike Channel. This is the first time that I've had you on the podcast, um, but we've worked together in the past um, just a little bit on some private issues. So, Ben, you are Ben Burr, director of Blue Ribbon Coalition. Can you give us a, a little bit of a background of who you are and, and what you're up to? Yeah, so I'm the policy director for Blue Ribbon Coalition. We're a national nonprofit that works to kind of protect access for uh, those who like to recreate on public land. So we work with federal and state agencies and do what we can to keep roads, trails, camping, and a whole bunch of other things open for the public to come use and enjoy. Uh, we know there are a lot of times when you have public using public lands, the, there are impacts. And so we try to educate people on how to reduce those and but the bottom line is we do try to make sure that they make good decisions at these land agencies, keeping our lands open for us to go enjoy them. And um, that's why, I mean, I'm familiar with your work. I know that you like to get out there and advocate for responsible tra trail use for the dirt bikers. And um, a lot of our members are dirt bikers. So appreciate you having me on. Yeah, I've been a member of uh, Blue Ribbon Coalition here, sharetrails.org for several years. I guess I joined back in 2016 and I feel bad that I rode for four or five years before even knowing anything about it. Uh, at that time, I, I just kind of bumped into the prior director, Martin Hackworth, and interviewed him. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta, I've got to become a you know a contributing card-carrying member of Blue Ribbon, Share Trails. And so I've been doing it ever since and try to donate and try to spread the word. Um, and one of, one of the things that has been frustrating to me as a user in this user group is it feels like there's a lot of apathy toward some of the issues that we have. And uh, you even mentioned that to me in a text message yesterday. Yeah. I sent out an email. We're going to get into it. I want to talk about this Moab uh, Labyrinth Rims, Gemini Bridges, Travel Management Area Plan thing. Um, and I, I'd sent out an email and I thought I did a little bit of homework and I was trying to you know, tell people, hey, let's, let's be substantive in our comments in this thing. And uh, there was something that you said to me in text message. Um, you said something about, I'll take, let's see, what did you say? You said, I'll take passionate, but slightly, slightly misinformed over apathy any day. So that was, that was you giving me, giving me credit saying, well, you're passionate, but you're slightly misinformed. So what I wanted to do now is just get you on, get you on the program and help, help all of us, um, understand the issues better, understand from your side, how these things are you know, strategized how these things are fought and won and what we can, you know, what we can do to get more organized. Cause I think that's, that's probably Ben, and you might agree with this. This is probably where we lose out on the ATV dirt bike side is we're not as well organized as the other side and we're not as well funded. W what would you say to that? Yeah, no, first of all, I'd like to say, I appreciate you being a member of the Blue Ribbon Coalition. We appreciate the support of people like you, uh, the efforts you do to promote our organization and and the years that you've done that. And because you are, 
in some ways an exception rather than a rule. And I don't, and I don't blame people for that. Uh, most people don't go, when you go buy a dirt bike or a side-by-side and you sign that check and put down a couple thousand dollars to take that step into this lifestyle, I don't think anybody at that moment is like, all right, where's a group I can go sign up for that I can go become to, and politicize this thing I decided to do for fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people don't, there's a lot of politics in this country right now. The politics tend to get pretty aggravating and, and I don't blame anybody's patience for running out and to bring politics into the thing that's supposed to be your release and your escape away from work and life. And the thing you go do for fun, I, I can understand why people don't want to go join groups and become engaged. And the process is designed to be, um, you have to be involved to be effective at it. And so with that said, though, um, that's why groups like ours exist so that we can go and advocate on your behalf. Uh, If you support groups like ours, you can do what you do, enjoy the sport and the lifestyle that comes with off-road recreation and the other forms of recreation we support. Uh, And, but it's, but you do have to understand that there is another side to this. There are organized groups that are working very hard um, to restrict access to public land. And for those people, it's almost like a religion. They do go to bed every night, wonder, thinking of ways that they can be restricting more access to public land from the general public. That they, That's what they get paid to do. They're professionals. Most of them are lawyers. And I, I've seen videos like this where, um, where it's like a, a podcast or an interview and you have two environmental activists and they have like a thousand pages of government paper on their desk. And they're just like excited, like it's Christmas. They just got a new man, a plan that they get to review. Wow. And, and that's what we are up against. And so our group has been in existence since 1987. We have been successfully challenging those efforts for that long, for over 30 years. And we have, we're one of the groups that successfully litigates these issues in court. And so we do go the distance on a lot of these things. Um, and so that's why it is important to support us. We are probably outfunded a thousand to one, but like I said, I mean, I'll take, I'll take passion any day and you can get pretty far if you've got the right people and they're smart. And even with limited resources, you can still make a big impact on this. Yeah, I something you just said just reminded me of what your predecessor told me in that interview standing in the mountains of Idaho five years ago, maybe closer to six, five, six years ago. He said, we don't lose because we're or, or he, he said, if the other side wins, it's not because they're right. It's because they're more well funded. And that's something that you just touched on. You said we're probably outfunded 100 to one or 1000 to one. And that's where we need to. We, we need to probably do better. Yeah. One, one, to of, the be pla- fair, one of the though, places. I mean, the economics are there. I mean, the industry itself, like if you look at um, just motorized outdoor recreation, it is bigger than all the other forms of recreation combined. You hiking, kayaking, rock climbing, camping, backpacking, like you start looking at the economic data of all of those. And people scratch their head when I say that, but I'm like, you can buy a lot of hiking shoes for what it costs to buy one dirt bike. Exactly. You can buy a lifetime of season passes to a ski resort for what it costs to buy a single side-by-side. And when you start adding in a a truck to tow the toys out to the play areas and the trailers, and I mean, you can get people that get into this six figures fast. And so the investments that people make to get into this lifestyle are significant um it'd be unfortunate after investing so much into the toys we end up losing the areas to ride because we didn't invest in the advocacy to protect the the open access to those areas and that's what we're trying to do and so we do hope people find a way to contribute and become members and um donate to the causes that we do that we get involved in that you believe in and if there's areas that are that you really like and that you want to make sure stay open um, we're the most effective when a local person comes to us and says, this is our area. We know it really well. We just need additional help. Yeah. Um, cause we can't possibly know every single 
area and issue in the country, but we can amplify the efforts of people who do. So you need the eyes and ears of the people on the ground, the members, Absolutely. to find out what's happening in the local area. That makes a ton of sense. It also makes a ton of sense to say, you know, the concept you're talking about where there's a lot of money behind this because all the users are spending thousands on these machines. But then you have the OEM side of things, which I don't think gets talked about a lot. And what what are they doing to help? Like Polaris, Honda, KTM, Suzuki, Kawasaki, uh, Skidoo, all of these, I mean, not to name drop, but I'm going, are these, do we have any help from them? Um, we do actually, uh, I just, we just got awarded a grant from Yamaha outdoor initiative. Um, that's one of the, the best grant programs I've seen out there for this kind of work. And Yamaha does, I do, one of our board members has gotten one of these grants and just completed it. And so Yamaha does have grant programs where they'll take groups like ours. If we come to them with a proposal and, provide some funding to go out and do projects. And so what we're actually doing with our Yamaha grant is creating a guidebook to document some of the trails. Like we're going to talk about travel management today. Yeah. Uh, some of these areas have already been done. And so we already know some of the trails that are most at risk to get lost. We know the ones that are being challenged in current litigation right now. And the BLM has designated as, them as open. If we as a community, go start using and recognizing these trails and that they exist and start using them, it's going to further justify the BLM's decision as this decision gets challenged in court. Um, and so we're creating a guidebook to try and help. The, I mean, a lot of times you have trails that are really, really popular. Everyone knows them. Everyone uses them. That's great. Um, but some of these other trails that are off the beaten path a little bit more is where we're more at risk to lose access if we are, aren't finding reasons to go enjoy those trails as well. Wow. And so our grant is to create like a guidebook of kind of forgotten trails, trails that people should know about, but just don't because I mean, in a state like Utah, we have so many great trails. You couldn't possibly ride every one of them in a lifetime, which is a great thing. We have uh, an abundance of that here, but all these trails have different purposes and needs, and some people might really get excited about going and exploring new areas, and that's what the purpose of this book will be. So Yamaha does it. Um, I am familiar with, I've seen a similar program with Onyx was doing, they have like a- the app, Onyx Off-Road. Yeah, they have a team they've hired that does some of this work I've seen. I have, I've just seen some like newsletters about it, but I, like at least shows me that they're working on stuff and they picked a few little pet projects and I think they were successful. Um, the challenge you have, like if you go look through the financial disclosures of a company like Polaris, which is one of the more popular side-by-side -side brands out there, um, their number one customer is actually the Department of Defense and the federal government. Wow. And so they're not going to go and fund fights against their number one customer. And that's probably been the biggest challenge we've run into when we go approach the OEMs about things is you have to be really careful about the politics of that. But I do believe that the work we do is doesn't have to be controversial. I think the outdoor recreation is incredibly popular. And if it's done responsibly, there's no reason that they shouldn't be able to back some of the things that get done here. But so far, it's been harder to convince them. The aftermarket crowd has been a lot more open to it. They're less sensitive to the politics of things. Their customers do tend to be the retail recreation users that, that tend to include people like you and me and you. Um, but we try. And I mean, when there are programs out there like Yamaha's, we use it. I would, I, I would like to see all the manufacturers create grant programs like that because the goodwill they get from that is probably well, like the bang for the buck is probably off the charts and they, cause we'll publicize it. I mean, I talk about it here. Once we're done with the book, we'll do press releases and you just give it out everywhere we can. And so they'll get a lot of publicity out of it and recognition. So we appreciate their support. Yeah. You'd think, you'd think that they'd want to do more of them would want to do that. But then the issue you bring up with Polaris is, I mean, there's no way I would know that unless you had, hadn't just told me that right now. So I appreciate that. These issues are always way more complex. And that's, I think that's part of the reason why I have a hard time sometimes getting involved with some of this stuff. Cause I'm like, how much time do I have to devote to learning this? You almost have to be living it. 
Otherwise, if you say anything, sometimes you feel like you come back with egg on your face. I felt that I felt like that a little bit yesterday um, when I was I was doing videos about it, and I mean I was getting slammed with emails from people all over saying, "Why aren't you going to do anything about this? Are you going to talk about this?" And so I talked about it a little bit. Then I sent you know some email information, and you know, and I'm like, "Well, it looks like." Not everything I maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm sp- spreading the wrong message, and it's it's a little deflating if you're not in this like you know knee deep in this thing. It, it can be kind of discouraging to be, you know. Yeah, well, let me speak to that a little bit because first of all, I mean, how much of your life do you actually spend out on your bike, exploring around? Less than one percent. I mean, half well, of a percent. You need to get out more. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's just it's just the the reality of it. I spend so much. No, I mean, I spend more than most people, but yeah. I mean, I haven't ridden for two weeks, you know. And so, if I'm lucky, if I get to ride once a week, is kind of where I'm at. And so, I spend more time in the outdoors than most people because I'll go out and it'll be six hours. But I'm not I'm not out there every day. Yeah, but I mean, I would say every time you're out there, you are actually doing the work. You might not realize it, and um, I want to speak to the efforts that you, you used. We let's transition to talking about this travel management plan. Yeah. And so let's back up a little bit. I mean, we've talked about the email you sent out our text exchange. And so what happened was, uh, so I heard about this travel management plan. I mean, technically BLM supposed to notify us of these things because we're essentially parties to this settlement and this lawsuit that is causing all these travel management plans to get redone. And so back in 2017, and even before that, SUA, the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, they sued the BLM to make them redo their travel management plans in 12 areas. So this is like all over the state of Utah. Uh, The judge basically, a settlement was entered into and the agreement was the BLM would do the plans again taking into account information that came out during the lawsuit from SUA. So that's the process we're in. And it's scheduled to take 10 years, give or take, from the settlement. And so this is a process that's going to be ongoing. We've already gone through different steps of it in different areas. So the San Rafael Desert is is done. There was a decision from the BLM of what roads they were going to open. And SUA is now challenging that again. And so then that's starting resetting the clock on that one. It, and the thing that's frustrating, I mean, you look at their challenge, their appeal, and at the very end, you get to the money line, which is we expect to be paid for our attorney's fees if we win through the Equal Access to Justice Act. And so this is just, I call them welfare lawyers. I mean, they are they wow. just make money if they even are remotely right on these. And there are so many little nuanced provisions in the environmental laws that give them standing to kind of challenge these decisions. They could tie these management plans up in court for my whole life if they want to. And they probably will, unless we get bigger changes at the, at the legislative level. For now though, there are serious risks that we'll lose access. So in the San Rafael desert, we started with this a plan. Is, this, is in, free... this is in Utah, just for the people yeah, listening. This so this, is, the this San is Rafael a... desert is it, a lot of people get it confused with the San Rafael Swell, and it is not the swell. It is This is an area that's south of Green River, on the west side of the Green River, kind of this big open area that goes down to Hanksville. And so it's a really cool desert riding area. It's actually right across the river from the area we're talking about today, the Gemini Bridges and Labyrinth Canyon. It is just over the Green River. It, so it's very similar to terrain to what you'd go ride in Moab, um, a lot less busy because it's not right by Moab. You have to kind of come at it through that road that goes down to Hanksville. Um, but that one is finished. They they started with 300 miles. That's what was on the books as designated open uh, when the lawsuit started. And so what the BLM did after was they said, okay, well, if you guys don't like our 300 miles we've designated open, we're going to go really see what's there. <laughs> And so they use satellite data, they go out and field test and kind of ground proof what the trails are on the ground. And the BLM found 1,200 miles of trail total. And so that became the baseline of what they decided to analyze. And then they ended up deciding to open 900 of that. Okay. So that back, and, so that backfired on SUA a little bit. So it did backfire on SUA, and that's why they're appealing it okay. right now. And so that's what we're involved in right now. And 
but that's happening in a bunch of areas across the state. We're Trail Trail Canyon, which is north of Kanab by the Coral Pink Sand Dunes. If you've ridden the Barracks Trail, it's that area. Another really popular area down here in southwest Utah. You're dry. You're, you're very much in formations and geology that looks and feels like Zion National Park, but you can actually do off-roading in that area. So it's a great area too. All of these have their unique characteristics and reasons to go there. Um, that one we're working through the process right now. Canyon Rims is south. It's sort of in the San Juan County, south of Moab. There's an area that we've submitted comment for. And Dinosaur North is kind of up by Vernal. That area has gone through a part of the process. And so that all being said, this is an ongoing process. It's going to take years and years and years. There isn't going to be one moment where the BLM comes out and it's like, Sua, shut down our trails. This is an ongoing process that we get to engage in multiple inflection points. And the end result, if we don't engage, is we absolutely will have our trails closed and our access restricted. Um, But it doesn't mean that we can't go reasonably engage at this point and potentially open more. I mean, that's what happened in the San Rafael Desert. There's people who will kind of pick words over that because we would have liked to have gotten the full 1,200. And even the 1,200 that was inventoried wasn't total of what we knew was on the ground. And so you get into the details of these and there's tends to be a lot of opportunities to actually expand access if you do it right. And so when this Gemini Bridges Labyrinth Canyon plan came out or the what was done, there's an announcement of the scoping period. And so for those who don't know what the government process is for this, it's called NEPA. Um, and that's the National Environmental Protection Act. It's the process they have to go through to kind of just make sure that they're mitigating and addressing all the potential environmental impacts of a decision. And this is a process that takes years. And to be honest, I really don't blame anybody for not understanding every step of this process. It's designed to be bureaucracy. It's designed to keep reasonable people away. Like if you are wanting to just go ride around in the desert and enjoy yourself and work hard and raise a family, like this is a process that's designed to repel you. Um, If you're a lawyer who loves and lives and breathes reading government decision records and figuring out angles on how you can sue the government, this is like Christmas. You get to read these things and go wake up every day and that's the whole purpose of your life. This is great. So the, the game's already rigged against us. Um, from the start. And so the process is it starts with scoping. And that's where we are now with this one. This is no decisions being made. No trails are actually being closed. Um, but if we don't play the process right, that is where we'll end up. And so there were a lot of, I posted about this on some groups and the post didn't get a lot of traction because they were kind of boring. Um, because what I was doing was actually doing what you're supposed to do with scoping is I'm trying to find out what trails are there. That's what scoping is. We just want to know what's there. This is where the BLM decides, well, we think there's X number of miles of trail out there, but if the public is aware of other trails that we don't know about, here's where you can tell us what's there and why those trails are there to use them. And so this is the point where we can come and tell the BLM, well, you identified a thousand miles of trail and we, that you missed this one, this one, this one, and like identify what they missed. And now all of a sudden they have to increase their number to 1200 mile or 1500 miles if they've left stuff off that's important and we don't recognize it, then yeah, we will end up with a lost trail right out of the gate because we didn't help them see stuff in scoping that they they would have addressed if we'd made a public comment. And so I got an email yesterday. I'm not going to say the name of the person who sent it just because I haven't asked for his permission. Otherwise I would, but um, he just said he called the BLM office in Moab because he saw some of these messages that were going out. And he says, there's a ton of misinformation flying around the moto scene right now. And I'm afraid it may do more harm than good, or at least it's a waste of time and energy. People I know have the idea that SUA is closing all the trails east of US 191. I called BLM staff at the Moab office this morning and had a long talk. They are wishing someone would get the rumor mill straightened out because the comments they are getting, and there's a lot coming in now, are basically useless repeats of don't close anything, which doesn't really move the ball forward. And so that's where I said in my text, I'm like, I still would appreciate, even if it's slightly misinformed passion over apathy, like I, I am encouraged that so many people are sending in their comments, but what we need the most right now are 
people sending in comments that signal that we know what's going on with the process and we're engaging in it legitimately. And so it, if you've already sent in a comment, that doesn't mean you can't send in another one. And if you already sent one in, it still at least lets the BLM know we're watching and that there are a lot of people watching this. And so they'll be more sensitive about it. I don't ever think you're wasting your time by engaging. There's just always going to be, even someone like me who does this a lot, in hindsight, there's probably always going to be something you could have done better or could have done more. And so the thing we need the most right now is for people to look at the map of this area. The BLM's published it on that page where you go make your comment. There's a link to the GIS map and it has all the trails they think are there. I've looked at it compared to like an Onyx off-road map or just Google Earth satellite imagery. And there are two track trails that are on the satellite maps that are not on the BLM map. And I, and that's what we need people's help with is what's missing. Any comment that identifies a, any a single mile of trail that's not on the map and we can have somebody comment why that needs to be there is gonna, that's how we actually, we won't just protect the existing access that's on the map right now. We'll actually expand the baseline the BLM's working from. And so that would be, I, I'm less worried about some effort that Sue is closing all the trails. They're not going to close all of them. The next step is BLM will take this base map and then they'll come up with four options is usually what they do. Sometimes I've seen five, but that's usually with the forest service. So you usually get a range of options. One, and this I believe is mandated by the settlement agreement with the court. They have to propose an option that is kind of what I call the SUA alternative. And that will restrict a lot. Usually you see hundreds of miles of lost trail and access on that alternative. Then there will be kind of a middle of the road one. Then there will be one that kind of opens the most possible. The, it's, the, it's the most OHV friendly. And usually a lot of these trails do exist for, there's usually grazing permittees out there that have roads that go to their fences and their water infrastructure. There's mining claims. There's going to be reasons why those roads are there that might not be primarily for off-road. Um, and some, a lot of times, like the middle of the road version has roads that are open just to the BLM, but not the public. So maybe for firefighting reasons, they need a road to still be there that if there's a fire, they can access it. And, and then those alternatives are just still, again, proposals. And if we come with more information at that point, they can add to that as well and have that be part of the decision. And so there aren't any recommended closures right now. Um, we, so we don't have to be running around with our hair on fire, but we should be we should be spending our time looking at this map and saying, what's missing? Can we add to this? Let's give them a really good baseline to start from. My friend of mine who used to be work for the BLM in Moab said the last time they did resource management plans there, there were 6,000 miles of trail that was lost. And so we have a lot to gain back and we certainly shouldn't lose any more. Wow. It's funny that you say the emails. I think that I think the email that you read, I think I got the same email from the same gentleman because he said I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna email Ben about this. I but I was just getting inundated for about 48 hours and finally and it, it was all levels, you know, it was all levels of of hysteria. Like some were not hysterical at all, and and so I went middle of the road on on mine. Um, but uh, this is fantastic information because. Because what you're telling me and all the listeners and all the viewers is this is a process. This is going to take, we're already three, four years into this, and we've got many, many years to come. The clock kind of keeps getting reset every time SUA, you know, challenges something. And then our sounds like right now, the number one priority from your perspective is for us to help get the map accurate and, and identify the trails for, for the BLM. Make sure that we get every mile of trail that we can because there's and, and we could come out ahead on this again. Like and that was that was in zero of the emails that I got about this from people. Like the information that you're giving me and us is fantastic because the sky isn't falling. We've got, you know, we've got a fight ahead of us, but there's also actually some green grass that we can gain yeah. back. I mean, I shouldn't say green grass because it's on it's in the desert. There's there's no yeah. there's and no green grass. Be... But. And it'll be an uphill climb in this administration. Uh, uh, the Biden administration probably has less amenable to that kind of a expansion of a travel map than maybe the Trump administration might have been. But 
but but I mean, you never know. Like that was another. You thing. never know if, I, you, if things are justified. They're justified. I mean, if you look at the route reports, if they'll have like a thousand routes that they're looking at, and each route will have a five page report on why it's there, who uses it, it like. And so a lot of times it's the counties have right of ways, the miners, the high, the power companies, the um, the ranchers, other people, like a lot of people have right of ways on these roads. And so you'll look and most of them have a lot of justification for them. And our use, recreational use is a justified justification. If we, if our, if my public comment is I'm a recreation user, I use this area. I enjoy exploring this area. There are places I haven't explored yet. I want to. I want as much open here as I can. Um, these are my favorite trails. Definitely don't close those. I'm looking at the map and I'm seeing some trails here, here, and here. I've included some screenshots or GPS coordinates or whatever. Um, I think those need to be included and open. This is why I go there. And what I've found in the past is the ones they close is if the trail appears to be unused, and so it starts to grow over with vegetation, then SUA has people that actually go out and hike these trails and they'll take pictures of them and say, oh, there's there's weeds growing in this trail. It's no longer a trail. And, uh, and so if we don't use them, it works against us. And in some cases, it's kind of hard because these legal challenges create an environment of uncertainty for our community and the BLM to say, well, it's not clear to us whether that's open. If we went and just started using everything we wanted, we could also get cited for trespass, but because it's in legal limbo, we haven't really seen any instances of the BLM enforcing trespasses against people using what look like roads and trails on the ground. Mm. And so we should be using them. We sh if you see something that looks like it's a trail, but it's unused, you can always take a picture of it and send it to the BLM and say, well, this is there. We, we wanted to explore it. We didn't, but it looks, can we like, creating that record of, is this a real trail is part of the work of this. And so if you're out exploring and dirt biking, you are doing the work. What I need is people just to kind of have an, an additional tab open in their brain when they're out there and they see a trail, even if they aren't going to explore it that day, or if they have questions about it, still take a picture, get a GPS coordinate, send it to either us or the BLM or some, and just start the discussion of this trail open. We want to use it. And then the BLM is kind of legally, legally obligated to analyze that and include that as part of its analysis if we're asking for it. Um, the other thing I want to add, and so this is, this is from the BLM's challenge of the San Rafael Desert Plan. The reason I bring this one up again is because it's further along in the process. So we kind of can see the playbook, what's going to happen next after we've gone through all these steps. And so this is what SUA says to the BLM. BLM similarly failed to take a hard look at impacts from dispersed roadside camping. The San Rafael Desert decision record makes clear that roadside camping will be allowed within 30 meters on either side of the center line of the designated routes where there is evidence the site has been used in the past. Evidence of past use includes vehicle tracks, rock fire rings, parking areas, etc., but while the EA makes vague references to potential impacts from dispersed roadside camping on certain resources, BLM makes no attempt to catalog where these existing vehicle tracks, fire rings, et cetera. Are. Like, they're, like when I read that, somebody who's been involved in this work for a while, they're actually coming hard after roadside camping. We know they don't like side-by-sides. We know they probably tolerate but don't care much for dirt bikers. We know they don't love off-roaders. But if you go out into the deserts of Utah and look around and see who's actually there, probably 70% Subaru Outbacks with Protect Wild Utah stickers in the back window. And that's who they're actually coming after in this legal challenge. They are trying to shut down dispersed camping on public land through these travel management plans. And the Subaru crowd has no idea. They think that Sue is their best friends and, and they, they're not. I shouldn't drop. And all so those <laughs> they're tying, they're like braiding their own rope. They're going to get hung with. And so we're, we're working hard to protect dispersed camping. I know a lot of off-roaders are also love to go out and dry camp and disperse camp and car camp. We have a lot of, one of the fastest growing elements of off-roading is overlanding and people building out their Toyota Tacomas and Jeeps and things to go do these multi-day adventures across public land. You have the Sprinter van crowd that is exploding. You can't even buy a Sprinter van right now. You have to just get on a waiting list and you have a lot of the RV crowd. And so that is the next 
like I'm, and this is not the only place we're fighting this. We are challenging a limit, a effort to limit dispersed camping in Alabama Hills in California. I saw just a notice two days ago that they want to start regulating and limiting dispersed camping in an area in central Colorado. Uh, this is the next wave of the access fights, in my opinion. And so, and a lot of times we're the same people, but there are a lot of new allies that we could potentially be gaining if we're educating um, the other people who like to use public land in these ways. And, and I don't, I mean, dispersed camping has impacts just as anything does. And it is exploding in growth, just like a lot of other forms of recreation are. So there's a lot of work to be done to educate people and make sure that they're not creating the impacts that cause the problems with the BLM. But the other problem we have, particularly in this area, the Gemini Bridges and Labyrinth Canyon, is to the south of it is Canyonlands. So that's a national park. So that has extremely restrictive policies in place to limit camping to just permitted backcountry or designated campsites across the highway is arches same limitations across the river to the west is the newly designated labyrinth canyon wilderness area similar restrictions and so this is and then you have the town of moab you go south of there you're starting to get into bears ears where I was on a meeting the other day with the Bears Ears Advisory Committee, and the, the, one of the discussions in their pre-survey ahead of time is what should they do to regulate dispersed camping in the Bears Ears area. And so this area in Moab, there's very few places left. And if you've been to Moab during the busy time of season, you know the hotel rooms get full. The campsites, you have to book them out a year in advance. If you want to just go play around in Moab, dispersed camping on BLM is kind of like the last option where you can maybe go find a spot if you haven't planned your trip a year ago. And so the BLM has to take that into account that there are so many other restrictive designations surrounding this one, that if they make decisions that limit dispersed camping, then it just, it, that's a good point we can be making now, uh, is that there are so many other areas managed restrictively that this area needs to be left open. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. You know, something else that was a little bit shocking to me, well, not shocking, but just interesting to note yesterday as I was responding to emails, and I probably responded to 100, 200 emails, um, there, was a, there was a lot of uh, sentiment of like, oh, well, that's what we get for electing, you know, this current presidential administration. And uh, of course, they're going to do that now. And I had to remind them, no, actually, this started in the previous administration, and it's going to continue to go. The other side of this, the environmental groups, they don't care who's in office right now. They're not sleeping on any of, the, any of these issues. And furthermore, in Utah, I don't think we've had, uh, you know, the people want, to, people want to talk about red and blue, and it's so frustrating to me because it isn't that simple. I'm like, we haven't had a, quote, blue governor in Utah since the 90s. I mean, there's only been one in my lifetime and I'm almost 40 and I'm going, these issues, it's not as just simple as like elect a red, you know, governor or a, a red president or a red senator. These issues are ongoing no matter, no matter what because of these other groups are so well funded. And when we just simplify it down to like, well, this is what we get for electing Biden. I'm just like, we are missing the point here. Is that right? Yeah, it, it, it changes the field a little bit. It's kind of just as like the difference between playing a game with a home court advantage or not, but you still play the game and any outcome is still possible. Um, the BLM in Utah, like if, once you work with these federal agencies, you learn that they're just agencies run by humans. They really have an impossible mission. Um, their mission is to manage public land and the number of interests that care about how public land get managed is just growing and and as big as the population of the country and so there isn't like a lot of times you hear like from the environmentalists that some people hate public land or the utah politicians hate public land and i'm just like yeah that's not what it is we all love the land the landscape's phenomenal and beautiful and like we love where we live but the public land management system is broken and it's a really challenging um, institution to engage with. And if you don't go into it with a long-term mindset, you're going to lose. 
And my experience is once you start dealing with a very specific issue, like once we get to like, let's say we find a trail that's not on the map and we have to go start arguing with the BLM that it should be a lot of time. The politics are just going to go out the window. It's going to get so nuanced. It's just going to turn into a discussion about weeds and animals and what the geology is and why that road's there and who's why, what the history of it is. And, and then a lot of times you can find that when you go and make your case and you're persuasive, um, you can influence anybody. I mean, we got heat. We did a video or our executive director posted a picture of him with Pendley, the previous BLM director. And a lot of people in our organization, or we got a handful of emails like, why are you with that guy? He's nuts. And, and we reply back, like, look, we've been in business since 1987. We've dealt with land use agencies for decades, all different kinds of administrations and all every political makeup you can imagine, both at state and federal levels. We have to work with everybody. I'll work with Secretary Holland. Um, if I if she gives me an honest hearing, I bet I can influence her to make some decisions that would be, I think I bring a lot to the table. And I think she brings a lot to the table as a secretary. I probably don't agree with everything she does, but she'll probably do a few, a few things I agree with. And regardless of that, I have to find a way to work with her because we're all kind of, we're all trying to fight for our interests in a thing that's publicly owned by everybody. And so you have to, you can't just assume that a change in the political environment is the decisive factor. It's not. And we're in this for the long haul ourselves. I mean, we've been involved in this as long as SUA has. Um, I think their organization maybe started a year before ours. Um, and we'll keep doing it as long as we can, as long as we have support. And so as long as our membership continues to grow, as long as we continue to have the financial resources to keep fighting, we're going to keep doing it. Um, but it is going to require that some of that passion gets directed towards organizations like ours so that we have the tools we need to succeed. But I, I'll work with anybody. I don't care about their political background. I, and once you know enough, you can go into any environment and be persuasive. You might not always get 100% of what you want, but you can at least go in and affect outcomes. And I'm not a. I'm never. I'm always confident in my ability to do that if I've done my homework and I have a good team of people behind me who've given me good information. Yeah. So something you said. You said the public land management system is broken. Um, and that if you don't come in with a long-term mindset, you'll lose. Can you just expand on that a little bit, that statement, the, the land public land management system is broken? Yeah, I can. So you have, like, the way the system works is you kind of, it's run out of Washington. You have a Secretary of Interior that serves at the pleasure of a President of the United States. And then you have a huge hierarchy of decision makers below that. And so that usually breaks down into a few regional people in Washington I guess they're in Grand Junction now if you're talking the BLM, but every agency kind of has its own org chart. And then you get a state director. So in Utah, um, our state director is Greg Sheehan, who's kind of, I believe he's from here. He was the head of Fish and Wildlife Service for a while. And and I don't think that, I think Greg Sheehan is a reasonable guy. I think if we made a good case to Greg Sheehan at the state level, the, the, the national people are going to give a lot of deference to the state people as long as we've given them good reasons to make good decisions. And so to, so to say, because the administration changed, well, Greg Sheehan's still in Utah and he's a decent BLM state director. Um, then you have different district level managers. So Moab is in a district that I think it's Canyon country district. You have a district in Vernal, you have a district in Cedar city a district in Salt Lake um, might be missing missing one, but then those have different field offices. And so in Moab, you have the Moab field office in Monticello, and they kind of manage that whole Southeast area that we're talking about right now. And each one of those people were run by a, a manager or somebody who has decision-making authority. And, and so these are people, they are not perfect people. They're fallible and they're, they're influenced by internal staff politics within the agency that has nothing to do with blue and red. It's just people climbing career ladders. And, and it, I, from what I've seen, you can, it can be, it is cutthroat in some ways. I mean, these are people climbing a power structure. And so the reasons they might make a decision a lot of times have nothing to do with what your political ideas are. It has everything to do with where they are in their careers, 
um, what they actually do believe in, the powers that have been delegated to them through law and through regulation and instruction memorandum, like just whatever the agency's guiding documents are. And, but it's, and so that's how the system works. And it's broken because the people are fallible. They're going to make mistakes. And, and it's just, they're just humans. I don't, I mean, I would make mistakes in the same position, but so they have to, and so they're very cautious. They need good reasons to make the decisions they make. If you're a well-funded environmental organization, you're going to have a lot more resources to give them a lot of paper to justify the reasons that they make. And so, and that all said, we don't have a good mechanism as people to remove them if they are repeat offenders and they make a lot of mistakes or they do things that are against the popular will over time. It's, And that's sort of the broader argument against an administrative state where your government's run by all these administrative agencies and not by people who are elected. And that's just where we are as a country. We've Our Congress basically just passes very broad laws and says, we're just going to let the executive branch and their agencies decide what they mean and then start enforcing them. The agencies then make them up as they go. And then if you as the people are displeased by what they do, you don't, you have a public comment period. And, and so it's not like if they're really bad, you can't vote them out. Yeah. You and they're they've unionized, and so they're incredibly well protected professionally. It's hard to get them fired. And so to have people with political power that the people can't hold accountable in a meaningful way is gonna result in a broken system. And we're not gonna fix that in a public comment on a travel management plan, but it is why I say the public land system is broken, is it just is we it, it needs a lot more accountability to the people because it's so, it, these public land management decisions really impact every facet of life in the, especially in the West where we have so much public land. Yeah, no, thank you for that, that uh, description. It sounds a lot like the rest of the federal government where, okay, you've got a few elected officials, but then you have thousands, if not millions of people under them that are working at all these agencies that are not elected and they're just, they're, you know, it's, that's their job and they've been doing it for 30 years and you know, you don't get to decide if you like them or not you and they're, and they're making decisions that are affecting you on a more granular level than who's at the very top almost. So especially with their, their collective influence. So, well, so what do you think people can, can do? I mean, obviously we talked about, um, We've talked, there's a, there, and I'll leave the link down in the description. There's the comment, uh, there's, they're, they're selecting comments or they're soliciting comments, I guess is the right word, um, for this labyrinth rims area. Um, what we need to do is identify, help the BLM identify what trails are there, um, on the maps. Are there places that people can go to find out what the current maps are? Well, so the link the planning link that has the comment form. I mean, mm -hmm. that does have um, the link to the current map that they're operating from, whether there are historical maps. I mean, those would have to probably be requested. Um, I actually, my favorite tool is Google earth. Okay. Uh, if you download the actual desktop software for Google earth, don't just do it through the web, but get the actual program that you install on your computer. It lets you actually go back in time they have satellite data going clear back to 1997. And so you can look at a certain, if you're like zoomed in on a piece of ground, you can look at that in like 12 different iterations for the last 23 years and see how that's changed over time. And so that can be a pretty powerful tool for just proving that something's there and needs to be looked at. Uh, the other thing though would be, we have so many of us out there. If you're out in these areas, I mean, you should learn where these areas are and then go explore them. And when you're out there, kind of document where you go and take pictures. And and if you notice other trails out there, it doesn't mean you have to ride every trail, but let's like collectively, if our, like as an individual citizen wanting to be engaged in this process, that's what I do now. When I'm out, I'm always kind of looking at trails and seeing what's there. If I yeah. see something, I'll take a picture, kind of drop a pin and go home and look at it on a computer see where does that go? What's it there? Where is it for? And, but to answer your broader, your kind of initial question, I 
I guess I can make a shameless plug for some of the things I'm trying to get going with this. So with share trails, if you go to sharetrails.org on our homepage, we have a link to what's called the 10,000 plus project. I call it that because this travel management planning process will impact, we believe, 10,000 miles or more of access in the state of Utah. And so it's one of the biggest things going on now, and it's happening so slowly that it kind of just gets these points like what we saw this week where it rises to the surface and becomes an issue, and then it disappears for months then rises to the surface. If you join the 10,000 plus project, it's just an email list. We can It lets us just keep you in the loop as to what's happening. And so you're getting good information from people like us who are following every step of it. I don't know of any single group that's following every travel management area as closely as we are. There are a lot of groups that are following specific areas really closely because it's their backyard. And I actually like that. Um, I support that model and I'll work. And usually they'll reach out to us and we'll work together and share notes and work on comments together. And, but the bottom line is I need everybody who even cares remotely about this to sign up for that. And then we'll do our best to keep you updated through email newsletters. And um, we'll always be putting these things on social media. I'll do things like this show. I, I try to get the word out as much as I can, but on one level, it's never been easier, but because there's so much out there, you get drowned out by the noise if you're not careful. So you have to be really selective about choosing your channels of information. Um, hopefully, maybe I'm too boring to a fault on this stuff because I know it well enough to be and it's boring stuff on some levels. They make it that way to dissuade people from getting involved. Uh, but I do do my homework. I do try and do it the right way. I try to understand what's actually happening so we can make the most impact. And so I am, tr I am giving the best information I have. Well, and um, a lot of this is a space where it can get sensationalized fast. I think that's what happened with this one. And I, it's, it's hard because it's sort of the paradox of social media. It's like that got it a lot of, to a lot of people's attention. A lot of people are engaged and are aware of this now, but now I need to channel that energy into how can it be the most productive. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, <laughs> that's what we're doing right here. Yeah. And there's, and there's a lot of work to do. This is going to take years. Um, I've also, if you look at sharetrails.org, we have, I created the Dispersed Camping Access Alliance, which is just a separate little group that will focus on these dispersed camping fights around uh, the country and not focused on travel management in Utah. But if you like dispersed camping anywhere, I want to start becoming a clearinghouse for here or where the fights are emerging on that front, because I think that's going to grow and grow and become a thing you'll start hearing a lot more about. Man, ben, um, we, so those are we, two ways you can get involved. We should have uh, led. We should have led with this. I've actually just brought it up in in on the screen in front of the on the screen recording that I'm doing, and I'm I'm just on the website. It's under you're at sharetrails.org. You go to current issues, and then you've got these these different um these different sections that the dispersed camping thing, ten thousand plus project. This is amazing. This is this is what I need to get people to do is to sign up for this so that we can get notified about the things that you're working on that's that's yeah, very and cool the, and we can create more content and so as these as conversations around these things evolve and then we can that can get populated with more content right now a lot of the work i do kind of gets buried in like facebook groups and things like that because that's where people are mm -hmm. uh, if i can get more people where i am it'll create less work for me and we can all talk directly to each other. And, and so that's the purpose for doing that, but I'm still, I mean, I'll still go where people are, but that's the, that's where you can come to me and to our organization and get information directly from us so that we can all kind of be playing on the same team. And I, I mean, that's always, I mean, in this day and age, you can always be doing better at getting yeah. your word out just because there's so much noise. <laughs> well, we we're, we were 50 minutes into this before you talked about that. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to record an, in, an intro to this and, and get to this right away and then jump into where we started, because I think yeah. this is important. I'm like, wow, this is something that I think could move the needle if, if that email list could, could grow and grow and grow. So, yeah. And then, I mean, the other thing I would add is, so we just, we got a, um, we are currently in a challenge with SUA on the San Rafael desert. I mean, they've filed their appeal in federal court. We've gone through what's called an administrative appeal process. And 
so we're building resources for that. And so all of these pages are going to eventually lead to like a donation page where people can help contribute to that legal fund. So if you're on our travel management donation page, as it, we're a 501c3, so we have to account for our money very carefully. And so that money does go directly into just this specific fight. And the thing I want people thinking about there is it if you were, I mean, being a member of our organization is the, is the, is the bare minimum of what we hope people will do. Um, but that's incredibly helpful. You become a member, it's a year, there's three different or two membership levels. And one of them, you get a deal. If you like the premium member, if you do that for two years, it's a, it's like $70, but you get, I think a discount or a coupon or something from a Rocky mountain ATV MC, who's a partner of ours. Um, but if people were to just do like a $5 monthly donation, if we had 10,000 people doing a $5 monthly donation, I wouldn't have to worry about money to fight SUA on these legal battles. I know what the costs are. I have attorneys in law school that they're like, all my friends are going to work for SUA this summer and I don't want to work for them. And I'm like, I, I can keep you busy if you want to work for me. And so we have attorneys that want to come volunteer time that are in law school that like we do a lot with a little. And if, and so $5 a month, I mean, if you can afford a hundred thousand dollars on a tow rig and a machine and a trailer and everything in between that it takes to enjoy this lifestyle, $5 a month isn't a lot to ask, but it means we've got to have the numbers too. So you got to go recruit other people and get the word out. And, um, but I mean, if we were pulling in 50,000 a month into that legal fund, we would, I would never lose sleep at night wondering, do we have the money to challenge them? And we've made it work till now. But it's we don't have billionaire backers. I mean, you look at who funds them, and they have these guys that are this Hansburg Wiss, who's a he's from Switzerland or something, and he, he they'll never not have the money. I've been in the courtrooms where they've been on these travel. Ma- well, it's actually the RS two four seven seven lawsuit with the state of Utah. They had like eight people there. They're probably billing out three or four thousand bucks an hour just to be in that courtroom, and that's wow. a court proceeding that's going to take months. And so we know that, and then at the end of the day, if they win, they get all their money back from the government. And so we can't go into it thinking that we'll ever win them in the financial side of this at this point in time with how their laws are, but we don't need a lot to hold our own. And so if people want to wonder how they can help more and those things help a lot. Wow. That's awesome. That's amazing. So we, we need to get people to comment on these things. We need to get people to sign up for your email list. I know that sounds super boring, but that's like, this is what we need to do. We need to become more organized and you're helping to create the frame for, the framework for that um, around several different issues. And, uh, you know, the, the I, I guess the, the takeaway for me from this is, hey, the sky is not falling. These, these processes are long, they're complicated, but we're not the sky isn't falling tonight. It's not falling on the 26th. This first initial comment period for this one Gemini Bridges thing is, is, uh, is closing on the 26th. But that isn't the end of the story. And then you're giving us the playbook with this other... with It's, it's the San Rafael plan. Desert. It's, and it's the San Rafael de- Desert plan, which is further along in the process. And so we can kind of be able to... T- it's a roadmap for what's going to happen with these other ones. And thank you so much for, for doing that and being being part of that fight. Yeah. And one thing I want to add is we have been successful in taking legal donations and getting them matched with um, grant programs as well. And so a lot of times when people are making a donation, we're able to go and leverage that into doubling it or more um, with grant money. And so, uh, I mean, that's what, that's part of the reason why having an organization like BRC carrying the water on the legal stuff. Like we've been around long enough. We have the credibility with the court system and the agencies, and we have the accounting structures in place that we can actually go successfully get grants and leverage those donations to get more bang for our buck. And so when I say we can do a lot with a little, we really can. Um, And, and I'll, I'll end where I started. I, it's incredibly frustrating that you you work hard you decide you want to go enjoy time have time off 
go recreate, have a release. We live in this beautiful state that has so much potential to do that. And so you then go make an investment into whatever form of like no form of recreation, other even hiking, they can, you can find yourself a couple thousand dollars in the hole. If you really want to go overboard with the gear, you go make the investment into the lifestyle that you choose. The last thing you want to do is then spend so much time and energy fighting to protect that from people who want it to take away. It's the last thing you want to have get politicized. And so I, I mean, I don't blame people when, to that this process is is not something you actively go want to get involved in and sign up for um especially around something that is designed to be your escape and your release from this nonsense um but i also would be lying to you if i said if you don't do it everything's going to be okay because it's not they really do want people restricted as much as possible from these areas. I didn't think they'd come after dispersed camping, which is their own people. I didn't think they'd come after mountain biking. They are. I, do, I mean, it. They're, the end goal, they're, they're not shy about it, is to turn 6 million acres of Utah into wilderness, which is the most restrictive land use designation we have. Basically means if you're on foot, that's your that's what you get, and maybe horses. And so it's, it's a violent theft of our public good, our, our common areas and our public land when they succeed. And so if we don't engage, then it is the sensationalism in this email. I mean, the BLM might feel like people are calling them now and are over, overblowing the situation, but that won't be the case in two to three years if we don't engage. The, the emails that got sent out that said Sue was shutting down all these trails east of highway 190 or whatever that could be an accurate email if we don't do this right and so anyway that's kind of what i want to leave you with um the sky isn't falling but you're gonna have to actually turn your favorite little escape and recreation pastime into a political project which is unfortunate but necessary and we're here to help well, thank you so much for doing that. And I feel I feel like it's just a, it's a progression that happens with everyone. Uh, you know, at the beginning of my riding, I wasn't, you know, doing trail maintenance, but then I started you get in and you start to see wait, hey, there are bigger things here. And if I don't, if I don't start doing this, all this stuff can go away. And so then you start doing trail maintenance, maintenance, and then you get involved with the Forest Service and say, hey, what can I do here? And the, <laughs> And this is just like the natural progression, and we've got to we've got to stand up. We've got to do something if we want this. Uh, if we want to be able to have these resources and these trails and these roads, and we've got to stand together. We've got to stop fighting. Dirt bikes have got to stop fighting with UTVs. UTVs have got. We've got to band together. We've got to act like adults, and we've got to be organized and, and stand together because we are all the enemies of these, these other groups. You hit it just now. Mountain bikers thought, you know, for many times, I think mountain bikers are, they're like, we're not going to get drug into this, but yes, you are, you know? So we're all yeah, going to be, to be clear. I, Sua is challenging the, um, there's a trail called the good water rim trail, which is the wedge overlook in the San Rafael swell. Sua is in court right now, trying to shut that down to mountain biking. Like right now, they're trying to shut it down and mountain bikers probably have no idea. And so, and, and because, of, and if you want to know why, it's because they're worried about an endangered cactus. That somebody will, will run their mountain bike into a cactus and kill it. I like, I, I mountain bike and I, have, I don't ever try to run into cactuses because cact I don't want to have to spend my whole day repairing tires. I thought cactuses were protected by biology. From mountain yeah, bikers. They are. They do. They have pretty good defensive <laughs> mechanisms. For, especially against something like a mountain bike tire. Oh, but it the hikers, the, the hiker is the only one that's gonna go over there and kick that. And even the hiker's not gonna kick it. You know, a mountain biker is gonna steer clear of that every day, all day. Because that ruins his day. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you anyway. so much. Thank you so much. I, I so much appreciate what you're doing. Um, the things that you're doing for all of the user groups, it's, it's awesome. It's amazing. I'm sure it's incredibly tiring work. Um, somebody has got to do it. I know that you and your colleagues spend a lot of late nights because I've been on phone calls with you at night. I've had text messages and, and Facebook, you know, messages at like midnight with you and your team. And so I just want to say 
thank you for being engaged and doing this. If not you, then who else? I mean, thank you. Well, it's got to be everybody. I mean, we can do a lot, but we are amplified a lot by other people. Uh, So I'll tell you, I mean, I wouldn't have been effective as I was with the San Rafael Desert, and I can't even claim... Like, I hate to even use the word I in that sentence because I have some allies um, with Sage Riders Motorcycle Club out of price. Um, there's, a, I'm trying to think, Castle Country OHV. I mean, there's a few, like you get in an area and you start to find there are groups in that area that really know that area well. It's their backyard. And the information they've helped me understand about those areas, it lets me leapfrog months of research of my own. Awesome. If they share with me. And so I've always said, I like, I need, if this is your backyard and you know it, just share your information with me and that'll make me more effective and you can go advocate too. And, but if I have to do the, all of it nationally, which we are a national group or one of the few national ones, um, a lot's going to slip through the cracks. The amount that slips through the cracks is going to be directly correlated to the number of people who are teaming up with me and helping. Yeah. And, and so the areas that get the most attention from us tend to be the ones where we have a really good engaged local group on the ground, knows the area, shares notes with us. And then we work together to participate effectively in these processes. And then they pass that information on to their, like, it just starts the, the, it grows the competency. And so we have an open door. I want to work with everybody who hears this, that is, um, willing to, I mean, if, if we have a membership base, we will, as long as that membership base is there, we're not, there are a lot of people out here that I could train to be effective at this as paid staff that we, like, I, I can get a lot done, the more resources I have and I'm willing to do it. Um, but it all depends on how well we organize as a community to pool resources and make sure we have those capabilities built in. How do people best contact you? I know I'm going to go sign up for the 10,000 plus uh, project and the camp free project with my email, but if, if people want to get in touch with you, your organization, what's the best way to, I know there's a contact us page. Yeah, that actually is a good way because that gets kind of, we have staff that kind of filters that to the right people. And we do monitor that email. And so if you do contact us through the email that's on the contact link on our page, um, that will get to us. Okay. So brc and at sharetrails.org. That's one. Yeah. What I'm else? in probably, I try to be in almost every Facebook group that I can related to this stuff. Uh, so on Facebook, my name is Benjamin Burr. I'm usually in a lot of these groups. If I'm not, invite me to your group. I'll come be part of it and help. So Facebook's a, actually a really great tool as well. I'm not afraid to be on there. I'm there. I spent a lot of time on there organizing and um, communicating with off-road people. Uh, And yeah, those would be the two places to start if you want sort of like a direct line of communication. Okay. Well, you're a busy man. I'll let you get back to your day um, and we'll keep fighting the good fight. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. Thanks, Ben. Bye. See ya. So that's Ben Burr. Um, That's sharetrails.org. That's what we've got going on in front of us. Um, I'm really glad that we had the conversation. Helps me to understand what uh, is at stake and also helps me like vastly to understand what the process is and and where we are at in this process. And there's multiple fights going on. Um, But yeah, I mean, if you... uh, you want to you get involved, there's multiple ways to do it. One of the ways is to go to sharetrails.org and become a member. Another way to do it is to go to the links to participate in this. And we've got to go help them make sure that these travel, the, these maps are up to date. So I've got them on the screen right now. You can, you can go to the maps. Here's the link. I'll put it down in the description. Here's the link to the travel management area. These are the, these are the maps that they're going off of. And we've got to make sure that everything is accurate in here. So yeah, boots on the ground, boots on the ground. Okay. Thank you so much again for listening to these podcasts. I hope the, uh, I hope that I'll be able to get this up on YouTube as well as out into podcast land uh, on Apple and all those other places that you, that we always see. Um, if you have suggestions for podcast topics, you can always reach out to me, Kyle at dirtbikechannel.com. Email is the best way to find me typically. 
Um, I don't do a lot of uh, I don't do a lot of social media. There's too much going on with social media. It sounds like Ben Burr is checking social media in in Facebook. So anyway, that's uh, that's the show for today. Wanted to uh, keep you guys abreast of everything that is going on here in Utah and in other places around the country. So, okay, guys, keep doing the good work and leave a single track. Thank you. Thank you.